Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Hi, it's Dr. Gemma. Welcome back to Cognitive Episode 49. Wowzer. Boy, I'm sort of impressed it's gone on this long. Thank you, those of you who are hanging in here listening. If you would like to make any comments, you can comment either on our group on Ravelry, or you can comment on the blog itself at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. I do love your comments. I've been a little late on posting notes, and I think that's interfered somewhat. So thank you to those of you who gamely hang in and do comment. In the warm thanks department, thank you, Deborah N. and Jan or Jana or Jan. I'm sorry, or Jane, if I'm getting your name wrong, but I really appreciate those delicious coffees. Uh, It helps to pay the monthly expenses of the podcast, and I think that's very, very kind of you folks. I am happy to provide the podcast without charge and without sponsorship, to be honest, because I don't have the energy to put that kind of work into it. So I really appreciate the occasional coffee from you folks. It is greatly, greatly noticed, and it does help. Okie dokie, let's see what else we have here. I still have the link for your e card to prove that you have a COVID vaccination. This from the state of California, other states, you might have to Google it in your home state. But if you're in California, there's the link. And I have found that very helpful. They will send you back a note that is good for 30 days with a QR code. You take a picture of the code or you can just download it. Either way, it will be readable from your phone. If you go someplace where you have to prove you've been vaccinated, What, you may say, is on my hooks and needles. You can tell I'm in a snappy mood tonight, can't you? It's been a very, very interesting day, and that's going to be saved for episode 50, I think, because I have enough material for episode 49 to tell you what's in my notes right now. But I am feeling very snappy. I'm having an interesting week all of a sudden. So, meanwhile, you say, but Gemma, what is on your hooks and needles? Well, I finished my hand-spun brick pullover sweater, and I love it so much. (laughs) I have renamed it. It is now the Mad Skills Brick, because for me, this is Mad Skills. I mean, I spun all the yarn myself, but it was not consistent enough to make a sweater out of, so I had to do some thoughtful work on it. So when you look at it, that red part that is Yak Silk Merino, that is actually two strands held together because that spun up fairly fine. That came out as kind of light decay. So it blended very nicely into a worsted. I treated the whole sweater like it was worsted. When you look at the stripe below it, which is alpaca fluff from my two girls, Jubilee and the late lamented Summer, applied against a single strand of a gradient yak silk. And the gradient went from that, from a brown actually, down to a pale, pale pink. And I took the lighter end of it and I blended it with the alpaca. And so when you see that alpaca looks kind of grainy, that's why, because you're looking at the little tiny bit of that single ply of the very fine yak silk that was plied against the two fuzzier plies of alpaca and this brought it out to a very nice worsted weight. Below it you have the silver which is a BFL silk and that came out to just a splat right on the nose worsted weight with a slight lean in places towards an Aran weight. So at this point all three were pretty much the same size. I was as surprised as anybody. Somebody wrote to me and said, oh, I've never been able to 
do that for a sweater. Even my socks don't always match. Trust me, me too. But I pulled these one after another right out of my fiber bin. I had no idea of working them together, but I wanted to get that gradient silk spun. And then I wanted to get it plied against something worthy of it. So what I did with it, like I said, the, the lighter half of the gradient went with the black alpaca. The darker half went with the remnants of that silver. So there you see in the body and the arms, the straight up silver. And I had two bobbins of it left. And rather than try to break it down into three and make a three ply, I applied the two remaining bobbins of it, little tiny bobbins, against the remainder of that yak silk gradient against the darker side. So what happened when I made the sweater? I started with that cherry red up by my face because any of the other colors would have washed me out, whereas that cherry red will make my skin glow pink. I know myself after 60 years of looking at myself in a mirror. So that's why the cherry red's at the top. Then I realized the trick there was to use that single ply of the yak silk that in the, against the black alpaca, remember, was basically a slightly lighter version of that cherry red going into pale, pale pink. And that's the direction you're looking. At the top near the cherry red is the ply with the cherry red. And so as you go down the alpaca, that single ply of the yak silk is getting lighter. And by the time you reach where the silver begins, it is almost the color of the silver. So that was my way of trying to incorporate a fade. Now I thought of going into, I think it's Dre Renee Knits, her beautiful fade patterns, and doing that with the sweater. And I just kind of got turned off to that. And I couldn't figure out why that went against my instincts, because that's such a good pattern, that fade. And I finally realized because the fade was going on inside the color of the alpaca yarn, I didn't want to kind of do overkill. I didn't think it was going to look right using the fade pattern, which don't worry, I plan to use in a cardigan real soon. <laughs> but this was the time to use this. So there you have the alpaca fading down to the silver in its own unique way because of that single ply in it. And then that's a straight up silver and that's reflected in the arms. The arms, I went all the way to the ends of the cuffs, the ribbing on the cuffs in that same silver. I was going to do the ribbing on the cuffs and on the body in that same fourth color, which is the silver plied against the yak silk. And I just didn't want to. I decided I wanted the arms to be solid. I thought it would look a little too much if the ribbing on the arms was in that same color. Okay, so I used up my silk basically getting to the ends of the arms. So you can tell when I'm knitting this, what I'm doing is I knit the red, I knit the alpaca, I divided in the middle of the alpaca, the black stripe, and then I kept tying off the body with waist yarn and going back and catching the arms up because I wanted the stripes to be even. Now to get a really nice even look, if I lower my arms in that picture, you will see the stripe at the top, the black stripe, looks a little higher on the arms even though it's exactly at the same place. So to kind of avoid that, I added two extra rows of the black at the bottom of the stripe on the arms and that made it come out looking nice and even with the black stripe on the body. So a little tiny bit extra. This used up the alpaca beautifully. And then I went back to the needle on the body. So I tied off the two arms again with waist yarn and went back to the body and worked on the body and got as far as I dared, got down to the ribbing on the body said, I am indeed going to run out of this silver. I better make sure I can get the arms done before I try the ribbing on the body. So I tied off the body again, went back to the arms, finished the arms, finished right down to the ribbing, realized I would have enough, but also realized if I tried then to use the straight up silver for the ribbing on the body, I was probably going to end up playing yarn chicken, and I did not want the ribbing to be two different yarns. Okay, so now we get down to the ribbing on the body, I switched to size seven needles as you do for ribbing. And that's when I realized that yarn that was two plies of the straight up silver against a single ply of the yak silk. That was coming out as a very thin yarn compared to every other yarn in this, except that cherry red at the top. For the ribbing, I could have used two strands 
together of that that um, silver plied against the the yak silk. Sorry, it's a lot of yarn to keep straight. And I decided not to. I said I'm on smaller needles, so I went with a single strand, and it worked out great. And I'm really happy with it. That last yarn at the very ribbing on the body is much thinner than the silver above it and yet for some reason I guess because of the size seven needles it worked out just great as the ribbing. Why did I bother with the ribbing? That a friend of mine was saying, a very good knitter in fact, was saying we'll just do a seed stitch. The ribbing is there for a reason. I didn't taper the body. I made the body a straight tube. Now as you can see I've got considerable chest and I'm not that big through the tummy. And instead of tapering, that's what the ribbing at the bottom is for. That the ribbing pulls in the sweater. And when you blouse it the way I have in the picture, it makes your waist look smaller. And that's what I was going for, is I wanted my body to look kind of balanced. And I wanted the waist to look tucked in and pulled in. If I had tapered the body, then yes, at the very bottom, I could have done just a seed stitch all the way around. I didn't need to pull it in. But if you're not tapering the body, in my opinion, you do want to have the effect of pulling the body in. And that's what the ribbing is good for, the ribbon and then blousing it the way I've done. So you make it long and then you add the ribbing and you pull the ribbing up to your hip level and let the body above it blouse over it. And that to me gives it the effect I want. It makes the body look more narrow and it, it makes you look thinner, frankly. The other trick I did for my weight. Now I put the cherry red at the top and you could see that the colors there were kind of a natural progression. Cherry red then the black with the gradient in it going from cherry red to silver and then the solid silver. And then at the bottom of the body, the ribbing that is silver with the gradient that again matches that cherry red. And so that was a pretty natural progression when I laid all the yarn out before I actually started knitting. But I was very happy about the black landing across my chest because the problem is without tapering the body, my chest is going to look big and it does tend to make my tummy stand out. I found out on my last brick and that's what the ribbing is for. That's what I learned from my first brick. I learned how to do the ribbing to kind of hide the, the lack of taper. And I also learned in my first brick that my chest is much more uh, generous than I had remembered. And so the black stripe across the chest makes me happy because I think it's somewhat thinning, which is not something you typically say about horizontal stripes. Uh, the only problem with that black stripe is that is where the fur from my own two alpacas, Jubilee and Summer lives. So I have to admit, the first day I wore the sweater, we had a cold day last week, as someday you'll see when I finish my temperature blanket. And the first day I wore it, I just kept thinking, oh my gosh, I'm wearing my own animals. It was so special that I found myself a lot of the day petting my alpacas and then realized one should not do that in public. It just doesn't look right based on where that stripe is placed. However, I will tell you to those of you who have kindly asked, yes, what I love about this sweater is that stripe. I never expected to be able to work with alpaca yarn in a sweater because it doesn't have a lot of spring the way wool does. Neither does the silk in this sweater. So in terms of sweaters, this one is heavy. That it is much heavier than the straight up brick I did in Malabrigo Rios last winter. There's definitely weight because of the silk, because of the alpaca. And there's not a lot of bounce back. You can't stretch it too much and expect it to bounce because that silk content stiffens it up a bit. However, I have to say, first of all, I never thought I would do a hand spun sweater. I remember when the Knitmore girls had a really great project where they were trying to get everybody to spin their own sweater and then knit it. And at the time I thought, why would you do that? Because that's too much work. And I was very intimidated by it on top of it. I thought my yarn would never be consistent enough. I have to admit, it is really a cosmic trip to spin your own sweater. I think the only way I would ever have done it is the way it happened here, where I didn't really mean to do it. But, you know, I spun those yarns pretty much in the order you see them from the neck down. And it worked. And I was aware that they all were harmonizing. And I just suddenly threw it to the wind and said, let's find out. And my thought all through it was, all right, I'll do this color. 
After this color, if the next color doesn't work, I'll keep a safety line in between the two colors. I'll rip out the second color and I'll get a commercial yarn and I'll finish this sweater and I'll find another way to use those other colors. So that's how I kind of coaxed myself through this. One of the things that intimidated me was back in the days when I worked at the prison, I remember the psych one of the psychiatrists coming in and he had on the worst looking sweater. And he said, my mother spun this and then knitted it for me. And, and then he looked at me with that look that dares you to say, ooh, that looks pretty rustic uh, or unskilled or both. But I have always held that sweater in the back of my mind, thinking about how his mother loved him and how he loved her because he actually wore it. And it looked, well, you could wear it to a prison, let's put it that way, in the winter. And I was always a little intimidated that anything I spun would come out like that. So I am sort of floored that I have finally spun my own sweater. And not only that, but that it incorporates two of my pets. And I'm, I'm just pleased with myself and delighted. And I suspect my knitting skills have reached their peak. Surely there are more things I could do to be even more skillful. And I probably never will. So the hand spun Mad Skills Brick Sweater is finished and is being worn with joy. The other joy that gave me a lot of happiness this week was I got really serious about finishing the brick and I said, okay, everything goes to the back burner. And so I started making plans just about the time I hit the ribbing on the body of the brick of what am I gonna do when I finish this sweater? Cause I was just about to die. I was so tired of knitting on it, which is odd. Cause I loved it right down to the ribbing. The ribbing felt like a bridge too far, but anyway, so I said, oh gosh, what do I do to reward myself? So the first reward was I said, I'm going to finish the Franken sock that I've got on the needles and I'm going to start the second one because I don't have second sock syndrome. I don't allow it. And so I have. Uh, even as we speak, I am working on the ribbing at the top of the leg of the second sock. The first sock is utterly finished. I made the entire foot in that regia that I made my fingerless mitts from last year for last winter. And then I got to the heel and said, oh, I should use a different color. And then I said, why? I really would like to use up this regia. And so I did. It was a bit of yarn chicken, but I got the entire foot, including the heel, out of that. And when you look at them, they're a little bit funky looking. <laughs> or rather, I should say that one sock is. And yet when I put it in my slide on croc, and I do love me some crocs, it looks great. In case you're wondering, someone said, are those crocs? Oh yes, they are. I wear black and navy blue crocs in the winter and I wear gray and pink crocs in the summer. I adopted crocs about the time I was diagnosed with diabetes. And you have to watch your feet in diabetes because if you're not careful, you lose circulation to your fingertips and your toes. And then you get them amputated, diabetes. It's not pretty. So I'm very, very careful about my circulation. And there's a fear that you can get your feet injured and not have enough sensation in them. That is not my problem. I get my feet tested regularly. I have normal sensation in them. That's why I work on a keto diet, kids. I'm keeping my sugar low. And so at the same time, I did take seriously that I'm not gonna go barefoot as often as I used to and I want my shoes to be easy. And so, yeah, we have a Crocs outlet near us in Camarillo, California, and I went crazy. And Crocs have become my go-to shoes. I wear running shoes when I do any kind of walking or running and hiking shoes, uh, same company that I get from Roadrunner Sports. And then I wear Crocs and slippers and I'm a happy camper. So whoever asked that, that's the answer to that. So there is a picture of the first Franken sock from Three Angles, and it looks terrific inside the Crocs. And then I said, okay, it's time to start working on the Wild Lettuce Shawl, and I have indeed started working as I record this. I believe I had, I think I've got 15 repeats of the lace edging left, and I've done three in the last few days. I just was very, very happy today working on it. I just got in that place and did two of the repeats. So the wild lettuce is back in very slow motion, but suddenly I can look at it and see that I'm going to finish it. All of this was done because I want to get onto Twin Faces Vest. But I said, no, I am not gonna to touch Twin Faces Vest until I have caught up other projects. This also led me to the temperature blanket, which was way behind. It was at like September 14th. 
as I record this, I believe it is at October 4th. It is behind because I need more of my winter colors. I realize I am way overstocked on the summery colors and I'm totally out of the colors that represent 50 degrees and 40 degree ranges. So another order to nitpicks, but hopefully this is the end of it. Hopefully I've, I'm using up what I can. I'm doing it in Brava Sport and the Sport weight worked out really well for the blanket size for my queen size bed. So the temperature blanket has been a happy hobby and I've been catching it up. Meanwhile, I said, but what about socks? That I have a thing this time of year. I like to do Halloween socks. I like to do some kind of harvest or Thanksgiving socks. And I like to do Christmas socks. So I went stash diving and I found an incredibly beautiful golden brown by Fiber Files, now renamed Sterling Ridge and not dying currently, just making masks for the pandemic and selling those on Etsy, bless her. But anyway, Fiber Files yarn is terrific. This stuff seems to date from about 2014. So some very serious stash diving. And it was really a joy to find it. And so there's a picture of it. It's just so beautiful, that color. So after I finish the Franken socks, that will be the next set. And meanwhile, we will get Twin Faces vest finally finished. That should not be too much work. That will lead me on to her sweater. She's getting a brick too. Meanwhile, what am I currently wearing? Hooray! It's Wooly's time again. As I record this, I'm sitting here in my beautiful vest from Ann Bud's Knitter's Handy Book of Patterns, which is the same vest I'm making for Twin Face. In the neckline of the vest, I've incorporated one row in the V-neck of the stitches in the color of Twin Face's vest. In her vest, she will be getting a coral vest with a line of the green stitches in the neck to represent my vest because we're twins. And I did tell her that. She was totally unimpressed. She just kept saying, is it going to be a plain vest? And I thought, boy, you know, considering you won't even send me your measurements, you've got a lot of orders here. But I said, no, I'm going to put in that line of stitches as a kind of matchy-matchy thing. She seems okay with that. In the meantime, it is woolly season, as I said, and I'm wearing my vest that fits me so well. I I'm looking forward to February, which of course is vestuary, when I will make another one for myself in another incredibly beautiful color. I have so much yarn, I can't decide what I will use. In the meantime, she gets a brick, hopefully around Christmas or slightly afterwards. I hope to have it finished by vestuary, to be honest. What am I wearing besides this? I am wearing knitted socks. I have Today I'm actually wearing Franken socks from I think 2019. I don't think these, I don't think I made Franken socks last year. I'll have to look it up. But I've sent you the pictures of the first day of Woolies season here, where you can see my socks in destination yarn. These were called the very pretty socks, colorway passport. And I'm wearing the insanely beautiful crocheted cowl that I made. This is the Lion brand country cotton shawl pattern that is free. Country cotton shawl no longer exists. But I highly recommend this pattern. If you're a crocheter, this is as easy as it gets. And yet it makes this insanely beautiful triangle. And then you hook a lovely scalloped edge on it. Very, very easy. All very, very easy. This is one of my go-to. Both of these, the socks and the shawl, are go-to patterns in my head. I've memorized them over the years. I, I've probably made about 30 pairs of the socks and probably 10 or 11 of those shawls. I just adore them. It is in a gradient. I can't remember whose yarn that is. I don't care. You can look it up on my Ravelry page or in the recent show notes because this was the shawl I finished a few months ago while recording this. That is this podcast. But it's woolly season. So I'm really, really happy to be back in my knits. What else? What else? I am not spinning, so no real dizzy blondes. So let's get to a strategy. And I want to talk about managing anxiety specifically. And to do that, there's two things. One is breathing and one is timing. Now, why am I stopping here? All right, I do DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. In terms of DBT, the skills I've already taught you in distress tolerance are good for anxiety. So if you're anxious, you pull out your lists of skills and you choose what you work on. For me, if I'm anxious, I use the acronym ACCEPTS. I use the A. I'll go to a different activity to distract myself. 
or I may use the E. I recognize that I'm anxious over a problem. I separate my emotion, anxiety, from the problem, and I work on relieving the anxiety before I try to fix the problem. That's the E scale. I may use the T, thought stopping, just stop your thoughts completely. Uh, or I may go to the acronym IMPROVE, and I may use IMAGINATION, imagine myself feeling relieved after I solve the problem, imagine myself a year from now when I'm on to whole new problems, or more likely I may use the P, have a prayer. <laughs> I, 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 I am a prayer. And I may use the R for relax. And I may use the E for encourage yourself. Okay, so those are the DBT skills as applied to anxiety. However, I find it more useful when I'm talking about anxiety to manage it based on more cognitive behavioral strategies, not the strategies that are CBT in the subset DBT. In other words, dialectical behavioral therapy is a subset of COG-B. So not all COG-B strategies are in DBT, if that makes any sense. So stepping out of DBT, but staying in cognitive behavioral. My favorite way to manage anxiety, there's two. The first is get air. Get air now. Anxiety is always in your body. That's why it hurts. That's why you get things like chest pains and cold sweats. It's in your body in a way that other emotional problems aren't. You're having biochemical reactions that are enhancing the panic and anxiety, okay? So the first problem in anxiety is you don't have enough air. I can tell you this. Boy, you can really see this in therapy. You get a patient who tells you they're anxious. You can watch them not breathing on Zoom. It's amazing. You look at them and you go, you are anxious. Your chest never moves. You're barely breathing, okay? So you can really see this in an anxious person. You can tell they're not getting air. You can watch them hold their breath for long periods of time. In fact, if you do my job long enough, you'll start watching a lot of things about people's bodily habits as they sit talking to you. One is their facial tone, another is their breathing. It's really kind of amazing, and I sort of find it cool. And when you tell people about it, some of them are really freaked out by you watching. Others are just fascinated. But anyway, anxiety is about air. Okay, to be anxious, for your body to get anxious, it has to build up carbon dioxide. The only way you can do that is holding your breath. So when you're anxious, you take deep breaths. That's all there is to it. I cannot tell you how frustrated patients get with us when we say that. But you have a patient in your office saying, oh, I'm, I'm having a panic attack. You go, okay, let me see you take a deep breath. They get so mad. They go, that's it? That's it? Yes, that's it. <laughs> Because if you have air, you can't be anxious. That's all there is to it. Anxiety is about a physiological trigger from too much carbon dioxide in your blood. So get oxygen. Now, when people are anxious, they can't breathe well. So you'll tell them to take a deep breath and you'll see them take these little gaspy breaths. Tell them to keep going. Tell them to keep trying. Because any breathing is better than no breathing, okay? So when you are anxious, the first rule is always take deep breaths. Now, if you overdo it, you're going to get dizzy. You'll hyperventilate a bit. Don't do that. Just practice slow inhale, slow exhale. Count it in. One, two, three, four. Hold it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, actually it's four, five, eight, but that's bonus points. I don't care if you're doing that. What I care in the beginning is just count to slow your breathing down in and out. Now, the bonus points on breathing, you can actually hit two things. You can not only fix the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide in your blood, you can also activate the part of your nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system that's going to calm you down. The way you do that is your exhale takes longer than your inhale. Why? Humans are beautiful machines. When we inhale, we activate the sympathetic nervous system that wakes us up. That's gonna make us more nervous. When we exhale, we activate its opposite, the parasympathetic nervous system that calms us down. So you can hear where I'm gonna go, can't you? That's right, breathe in faster than you breathe out. You wanna breathe out really slowly because you wanna spend more time activating the parasympathetic nervous system that calms you down. Gemma, you are all wringing your hands at this point going, Gemma, how many times are you gonna tell us this one? 
as many times as I need to. This is one of the most critical factoids to know about managing your mood, that slow exhale. You learn it in yoga class. <laughs> The Hindus are way ahead of us on this one. They know all about breathing. You can download all sorts of breathing tapes on YouTube, and I highly recommend you go watch them because breathing is so crucial to mood maintenance. I'm serious. So yes, if you want to learn something useful, learn the four, five, eight. Breathe in on a count of four. Hold for a count of five. Breathe out through pursed lips on a count of eight. You have to learn to do this. It's not that natural. We tend to breathe in and breathe out at roughly the same rate. If you can learn the four, five, eight trick, you are really going to calm yourself down really fast. I mean, when I do four, five, eight, I can bring myself to calm and usually about four of those things, I can put myself to sleep completely unconscious. I mean, at night with five of them. So four, five, eight. Okay. So the first thing about managing anxiety is always going to be getting air. The second thing is to realize that anxiety is only a mood. It's a physical condition in your body and a mood in your head. All moods change. You're not going to stay anxious. Well, that sounds really stupid, right? Because most of you are going, well, Gemma, I know that. Yeah, well, you're not going to think of that when you're anxious. When you're anxious, you feel like you're going to be that way for your whole life. Depressed people, same problem. Okay. So even though it's common sense, listen, your mood's going to change eventually. You're going to have a hard time remembering that when you're really clinically anxious. So I want you to hold on to that reality. All moods change. Your anxiety will go away. Now here's the interesting thing. It actually has to. In a state of really heightened anxiety, your body cannot tolerate that state. It would kill you. So your body will not tolerate that state. Your body will save your life. It's only in B-grade cheap horror movies that people die of heart attacks from anxiety or fright. It's actually pretty hard to do that, to be honest. So your body is going to try to save your life. It's not going to let you stay anxious to the point of killing you, even though you feel like it will. In fact, research suggests it depends who you read. You can only maintain that state really heightened between seven and 20 minutes. In my case, I think it's seven. To be honest, watching patients go into anxiety in my office, I think it probably is the worst part is about seven minutes. However, there's like a hangover. So you get over the worst of it, but now your body is tired and you feel sort of like you're burnt out. And people will often see that as still being anxious, whereas I would see it more as your anxiety hangover. Doesn't matter. You got about 20 minutes of this puppy in my estimate professionally. Okay. So when you get anxious, if you can remember, you got to try to remember this, look at a clock. As soon as you remember these words, look at a clock. Sure. You forgot to do it. Guesstimate. Well, I think I've been anxious for about three minutes already. So I'll move the minute hand back to three minutes. Now you're looking at a clock. So the clock right now for me says 6 40 PM. So 20 minutes from now at 7 PM, I'm going to be okay. That's how you do it. You look at a clock, you guesstimate as best you can. When did this start? You add 20 minutes. You say, by that time, I'm going to be okay. Now, what will actually happen when you do this? Your body will try to play beat the clock. Human bodies are amazing. Your body will go, oh, oh, we've got 20 minutes. Well, let's go for 18 because your body wants this to end. When you time your anxiety, you're actually giving your body permission to end it. You're actually informing your body that we're going to end this and your body will try to work with you on this. Big surprise. Your body is even more serious about not dying than your brain is. Your body is determined to stay alive as long as it can by working as hard as it has to. So when you time your anxiety, when you guesstimate, okay, in 20 minutes from now by X time, I will be over this. Your body's going to work to do that. So if you want to end your anxiety, that's how you do it. So you can use the skills from DBT. You can distract yourself by doing an activity. You can pray. You can take deep breaths to relax. In fact, that's what I'm describing, but you can also time it. And then you're going to use the E from improve the encouragement. Like I know in 20 minutes, I'm going to be okay. I just got to make it 20 minutes. And actually, as you do this exercise more and more frequently, it'll get shorter than 20 minutes. Okay. My worst anxiety now is about 20 minutes. When something really catches me off guard and frightens me, I now know I got 20 minutes till I can think. 
Now that's important too, that you're going to give yourself permission to get over the anxiety if you can before you do anything else. Let me say that better. You're going to give yourself permission to get over the anxiety before you do anything else if you can do that. Now if you're in an emergency, your house is burning down, no, run out of your house. Forget to get over the anxiety first, okay? If your kid is in front of you and they just injured themselves, call 911. Forget I'm going to manage my anxiety first. Manage your kid's blood flow, okay? But most of the time you're not in that kind of emergency. So most of the time you actually can say, before I solve whatever just frightened me, I'm going to calm myself down. You manage that anxiety first and you will recognize this is the E from the acronym ACCEPT, separate emotion from the actual problem. So you manage your emotion first because if you have to solve a problem, you'd rather solve it when you're calm than when you're anxious. Most of the time anxiety interferes with problem solving. Okay, so there are some tips on managing your anxiety. It's a little bit outside the DBT corridor, but I wanted to get, stop and give you that before I go back to more DBT. Put a lid on it. Well, there's a lovely picture of my two favorite types of chaffle, the savory chaffle on the bottom left and the chocolate chaffle towards the top right of a slightly diagonal picture there with, of course, the trusty Diet Coke. Now, the interesting thing is the chocolate chaffle, all chaffles, rely on cheese and egg. The chocolate chaffle uses cream cheese. Turns out, though, you don't actually need the cream cheese, I suspect. It's nice, but it doesn't melt or blend well, and I suspect you could make a keto chocolate chaffle with no cheese in it and use almond flour instead. Okay, and I haven't tried that yet, so I'll let you know, but typically when I make chaffles, first I make the savory chaffle, which is, of course, half cup of any cheese I want mixed with a beaten up egg, and then you pour that and you add any spices you want into your waffle iron. Now, I'm not using the mini iron here. The mini iron gives you a thinner, crispier chaffle, and you can make like two and a half out of the same amount that I'm using in this picture. I'm using the bigger four-part waffle iron there, a big round iron that gives you this circular waffle or chaffle, and it's in quarters. Okay, so I'm using the big iron there, and this works nicely. This recipe works nicely there. One egg to a half cup of shredded cheese works really nicely in the big waffle iron. Now the interesting thing is when you do the savory chaffle, it leaves oil behind from the heavy amount of shredded cheese. The chocolate chaffle absorbs that nicely. It strangely doesn't flavor the chaffle, but it does make it release nicely from the beautiful silicon coated waffle iron. All right. So I was looking at these two babies and thinking, well, you know, the savory chaffle is a little bit oily. Maybe I'd like to absorb that oil a little bit. So this time I added a tablespoon of almond flour to the savory chaffle. It's already in the chocolate chaffle. I really liked what I got. I got a firmer, less, slightly less cheesy chaffle that popped out nicely from the nice uh, waffle iron and not as much oil left behind. Things to know. When you do a savory chaffle, the softer your cheese, typically the more oil you have left behind. In the chocolate chaffle, you don't have oil left behind because there's so much almond flour. I want to say there's two tablespoons in there. It might be two teaspoons. Even so, as a fair amount. Okay, what I want you to get is I did the undoable. I added a tablespoon of almond flour to my savory chaffle. It worked out really nicely. It did not cut the flavor of the savoriness at all. It didn't make it more neutral and less flavorful. I would not use coconut flour in a savory chaffle, although it goes quite nicely in a sweet chaffle. The recipe I have for the chocolate chaffle uses almond flour. I prefer almond flour, fewer carbs, so I'll use it where I can. So what you have there are my nightly dinner chaffles. Uh, when I make myself a meal, and I want a quick meal, I will basically grate up any hard cheese I have lying around. Swiss, I've used Havarti, it's, it's very weak and leaves things very oily. Uh, cheddar, double Gloucester, 
My favorite cheese for the savory chaffle. Trader Joe's makes a double Gloucester that has chives and onions in it. They sell it in thin orange slices, tightly wrapped in saran wrap. I think that makes the best savory chaffle. As you can see, I have added sour cream. I will also use plain yogurt, Greek yogurt. But in this one, it's sour cream and, of course, my can't live without it keto salsa on the chocolate chaffle. <laughs> it's just unwhipped whipping cream because that's how it's good. Ah, uh, shoot, no riding on the fit desk, but I did get to rock climbing this week and I really was throwing myself at it. I did a 90-minute session and then a 45-minute session. And there's a lovely picture of my son leaping off the boulder wall. I'm lousy at that because I lose concentration. My fingers cramp. I can't get them undone. So I've ripped a lot of deltoid trying to jump off the boulder wall. As a result, I've stopped bouldering. I'm just working on improving my belaying skills, to be honest. I just don't like jumping off the wall. And you have to get used to that in bouldering. They have very heavy padding underneath it. But there is Superboy. Actually, at the top of my notes, you can see him jumping off. Under the aw shoot section, you can see him doing an act of tremendous strength. He is hanging upside down on a wall that is tilted 45 degrees away from the vertical. So the top of the wall is closer to you than the bottom. So he's hanging there at this angle. That is hard enough. You've got to really press your body upwards into the wall. It's not just a matter of having your feet and hands in the right place. But then he's trying to go around that corner and that's where it gets insanely hard, where you take your arms, which are on the same 45 degree plane as your feet, and then you bring them around that curve, that around that edge rather, to be on the wall that is perpendicular. And the next thing that's going to happen if you're not really strong is your feet are going to swing out with momentum like a pendulum and rip you off the vertical, the perpendicular vertical wall. So, first of all, to do what he's doing, to just swing around that wall without letting your feet fall and drag your body down is tremendously hard. And then, of course, being Superman, he just went right up that wall. There weren't enough arm holds. They had actually stopped the trail right at the place where you pass the bend. He didn't like that, so he just kept going up. I honestly don't know where this kid got the strength from. He's immensely strong. I do believe he's the strongest person I've seen in that gym because he does things I, I've never seen anybody else able to do based on strength. He's not always the most agile kid. He can't get up some of the more difficult trails. But in terms of strength, he's amazing. So anyway, I also this week, they're getting rid of my favorite blue 5.6 path. And 5.6 is one step up from the easiest, so I'm working on that these days. But I finally topped out on that one last week and this week I topped out on the one that is infamous for having a brain as part of the path a half brain hammered into the wall and that one was scaring me because at the top of that the wall tilts out about 25 degrees from the vertical and I just hated moving my hands off the vertical plane to that tilted plane you don't have to move your feet you only move your hands for the top two rungs but I managed it this week because my son was yelling encouragement let me tell you if you're afraid to climb, you need a 15-year-old who looks up to you. You'll be amazed what you can climb when that kid is screaming, Go, Mom, go. I certainly was amazed. So when next I go back, my pet 5.6 trail will be disassembled. Alas, they'll replace it with another one. They do. They don't change it that much. On to the fluffy books. I finished Ambush or Adour by Gail Carragher. Not the strongest entry in this series, but very sweet. I was a little disappointed because I thought there was something to be said here for asexual love, but she didn't quite go that far. And I liked it anyway. It's about restraint and about accepting your partner so much for who they are that you accept that they are not with you as much as you want. And you accept that they need a certain freedom. It's a very difficult concept. It's very sweetly told. It's a bit poignant. The ending, when she finally gets to the end, you thought, well, this is great, and she doesn't really develop it. I was a little let down. But Ambush or Adore, it's a nice entry in the Parasol Protectorate long-term series. It's actually in the sub-series of Finishing School. Strangely, I started and finished Miss Seton Sings by Heron Carvick. 
Miss Seaton is an elderly retired drawing teacher who shows a certain intuition in her drawings that comes in useful to Scotland Yard. It's a very improbable premise, and I think it's meant to be humorous by the original author, Heron Carvick. And after Mr. I assume Mr. Carvick passes on, because I don't think a woman would write this way, other people take up the series and they always use the initials HC, but they make it stand for different names. So I decided, I read one of the, I think it's Hamilton Crane short stories. It was meant to be a prequel to the whole series. And I was so disenchanted with it. And I thought, but I do like the character. Let's see what the originator does with the character. Miss Seaton Sings, I didn't check the copyright date, but it feels like it's written in the late 50s or early 60s. And she's a bit of a relic of an earlier age, and she comes with all the British biases that would come with an elderly woman. She thinks Italians are superstitious. In fact, so does Heron Carvick. And you got to live with that in this book. It is a relief. There is one black character and she actually doesn't resort to idiotic stereotypes. Thank God. I acted, I would have just been like, okay, I'm done. I'm Italian. I can handle, oh, look, it's another Italian stereotype. Look at how ridiculous my people are. Hardy, har, har, har. Particularly when you're British uh, and you know better than the rest of the world. However, the book doesn't lapse into that. And the, first of all, it doesn't lapse into anything cheap about Africans. And I'm kind of relieved about that. I don't know if he's actually African. He's described as black, but in the in that era, she would have seen anybody not white as black, I suspect, or the author would have. But it's really nice. He's an intelligent character. He's a bad guy. He comes to a sticky end. But, you know, I didn't feel like there was, like, crazy stereotyping, thank God, the way there was on the Italian character, who's also a bad guy and comes to a superstitious and bad end because my people are. All right, why am I putting up with all that? Because obviously it annoys me. Because Miss Seaton herself is a caricature. They're all caricatures. So I have to admit, Heron Carvick is kind of painting with a fair hand. That for every stupid thing the Italian character does, Miss Seaton is doing stupid British things that I think the larger picture here is that the author sees everybody as having cultural problems or stereotypical actions or whatever. So, you know, you have to decide if you're in for that kind of thing. I decided that Miss Seaton was such a loony that I would accept what they did to the Italian character. I was relieved. Um, you really can tell America has a more recent and even more hideous history of slavery than Britain does, because I can't imagine what an American author would have been doing to that gentleman of color. But even so, uh, for some reason, Heron Carvick doesn't do that, and I'm kind of relieved. Instead, what Carvick does is anybody who's not British is painted with the brush of foreigners are kind of crazy and they don't think like us. However, once you see how the Brits think in this book, you think that's probably a good thing because the Brits aren't too clear-minded. Of all the characters in the book, the only ones who don't lapse into that are there's uh, a chief inspector, Delphic, who goes the other way. He's almost too perfect. And then there's his normal sergeant. I think the guy's name is Ranger, Bob Ranger. And they're just kind of, Bob Ranger's like the normal guy. He has very little to do. He's just kind of in the background about to get married. Um, so I don't know what to say. It's a comedy of Miss directed information and it's written with a uh, late 50s bias towards everybody and it doesn't well you know I while I was slightly offended by the way the Italian was treated since everybody's getting you know tarred with the same brush everybody's kind of crazy I don't know I actually liked it I actually started to read one of the other books in the series but you know again uh, you got to live with the fact that you're going to see Stereo, stereotypical British crazy, stereotypical Italian crazy, stereotypical I'm foreign to the British crazy, stereotypical I'm a British cop and I really can't think for myself. I mean, it's just like reading a bad parody of everybody. And somehow it worked for me. So I'm going on to read another. We'll see how it, it works. 
In terms of cozies, I'm surprised people kept the series going after her and Carvick went to that great library in the sky. But I don't think I'm going to follow it that far because I think this might wear out after one or two books. Meanwhile, I started Murder Most Pemberley by Jessica Berg. No. Now, I have an unfortunate proclivity to read books related to Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice or any of her books, but most especially Pride and Prejudice. And Murder Most Pemberley, this has been done before. Let's have a descendant of Lizzie Bennet be a detective. It's a little too frothy and giggly schoolgirl. Let's also mix in the sexy guy who has remarkable restraint, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to get through it. I'm listening to it in the Kindle version. I'm not spending the money on the Audible. I'll let you know. I am going to try and plow through it. The villain is a little too upfront. I feel like the mystery is being painted with a clumsy hand, but we'll see how that goes. Something I really like, I love this general trend towards online adult classes. And what I mean by that is the good old days or the bad old days. You went to your alma mater and they would have a lecture course that you could watch lectures online or you could come to campus, pay a fortune, listen to some bored professor, I know because I was one of them, who's augmenting his salary or her salary by doing a summer class, which they don't take all that seriously. Okay, now some of those are good. I mean, I've known professors. My colleague John Springs to mind was a wonderful guy. Can't think of John's last name. It's just a delightful guy. And Erstein, John Erstein. John did this summer adult Shakespeare class in Ashland, Oregon, and he had a great time and he took it very seriously. So there are some good ones out there. Okay, but meanwhile, most people don't want to do that and they didn't want to pay the money. Now we've got this series since the quarantine. All these people have come online with their own classes, which some of them like Skillshare, you can just apply to teach it. You just submit a syllabus and they say, sure, and you've got to drum up your own audience. I have a colleague who did that for Psych, for Women's Empowerment, did a nice job with it. And then there's Masterclass. Masterclass advertises. It goes out and it gets these big name people. I think they had Ron Howard on directing, for example. I think that was Masterclass. They find famous people and they have them teach classes. I've been enjoying this. Strangely, where I found the best version, Masterclass has a rock climbing class, which I keep meaning to take. But actually on the Calm app, they have Masterclass. They call it that. And I listened to two of them last night. One was Dr. Adam Alter talking about screen addiction. The other one was on Stoicism, which is one of my favorite philosophies and I have always thought gets a bad rap in the modern world. The Stoicism course is great. I can't remember the guy who taught it. Alter's class on screen addiction was surprisingly good. I really thought, oh, he'll kind of blow this off. No, it's only three lectures. They're each about 15 minutes. And it was really useful to me. I mean, it was worth the price of admission. I would have paid for this guy, but it was free on the Calm, C as in cow, A as in apple, L as in lemon, M as in Mary, app. And this was an unexpected bonus. The Calm app, I don't know why they're putting classes on it, but they're all, you know, life management and stress management classes. They're very interesting. Stoicism got in there because one of the founders of Calm just thought, hey, look at this. We can get this guy. Really, really good. So I really like this trend towards mounting classes for reasonable adults, most of whom I'm sure they expect to have a bachelor's degree. Although I don't, in master class or Skillshare, I don't think you need a degree particularly, but I think they expect that's the audience they'll attract. I really like this, that you can pay a subscription price for a year and just get these classes. And they're really fun. They're on a huge variety of topics, baking, cooking, stoicism, philosophy, science fiction. I've got one loaded up about the science and science fiction, screen addiction. I cannot even tell you stress management. There's a lot of these. So I really would tell you if you see ads for this coming by on your screen, check these out. Certainly, if you're using the Calm app, I would recommend their master classes. I think they're terrific. Moving on to the blather, there isn't much, and that's good. <laughs> 
more next week. I haven't really done anything on my embroidery project. I also have an old embroidery project, Pennsylvania German project I designed that I want to finish before I get on to the Celtic Knotwork Collies, but they will be coming. The other thing I wanted to talk about, uh, the master class made me think about this with Stoicism, and that is when since the quarantine, there's been a lot more boredom. People can't get out and about and do the things they used to do. They don't feel comfortable spending a lot of time in public. And so there's been a lot of boredom. A lot of us are taking boredom and calling it anxiety. And I think that's really interesting. I think I was listening to Dr. Alter talk about screen addiction, and he pointed out, we no longer know how to handle boredom. We use our phones for that or our tablets. And I thought it's really true that we reached this topping out point, particularly in the quarantine last year, where people even got tired of the stuff on their tablets and started getting bored. And suddenly I had a lot more patients who were anxious and they would date it to the beginning of the quarantine, but they weren't afraid of COVID. They just were like bored. They didn't know what to do with their time. They were overthinking problems. They didn't develop thought stopping and thought redirection. Instead, what they developed was play on your tablet or your phone. And I don't mean that in a nasty sense. But I can't tell you how many times I've been in public where I'll see a little kid acting out and the parent hands them a tablet or hands them their phone. Now, I recognize in a crisis, that's not the worst thing to do. But do you want to do it every day all the time? No. You want to teach your kids other hobbies. Hey, knitters. Yeah, you want to teach your kids to knit. You want to teach them that they can create and make things for themselves. You want to let them play with color. You want to let them use your sewing machine and quilt or your spinning wheel. Years ago, I went up to the Huntington Library. I was invited up by the LA Spinning Guild to take part in a demo at the Huntington Library. So I took my really indestructible wheel. I took my old Ashford traditional that I felt was a pretty safe wheel and also is kid friendly, that everything's at a good height and range for a younger, smaller person to use. As opposed to some of my other wheels, it helps to be adult sized. So I took my traddy and I was surprised because all these people were spinning and kids kept walking up and saying, can I try? And everybody was saying no. And I thought, oh my God, and a kid came up to me, his boy said, can I try? And I had this feminist moment of kid, you're a boy. You really should try. You're about to learn what it's like to be a girl, that this should not be sex or gender based, but this is a woman's traditional thing. And it won't hurt you to know that this is what women did with their lives centuries ago. It won't help hurt you at all to have a little more empathy about this. So I got that kid on my wheel. And his mother was like, no, no, honey, that's for girls. And his sister laughed and goes, you shouldn't do that. And I said, yes, he should. And I said, this is a human skill. It's not a girl skill. It's a human skill. And I taught that kid to spin and he had a blast. And then the sister's like, well, I want to turn. And he said, well, you have to wait. And she said, I want to turn. It's a girl thing. And I said, it is not a girl thing. And you're going to wait. Pretty soon I had a line of little boys. But even more satisfying was the other spinners looked at me and one of them said, I can't believe you're letting a kid use your wheel. And I said, why? Why would you bring a fragile wheel to this kind of demonstration? It's really cool to show historical wheels. I get you. If that's a hundred year old wheel, I wouldn't want a little kid on it. This is a 1994 Ashford traditional. Get on the wheel, kid. I would rather make a new spinner because I know how to fix that wheel. It's not that hard. He's not gonna break anything I can't fix. But it was so important to me that an hour later, most of the people there with wheels had kids on their wheels. That's what we have to do. We have to teach kids our skills. We have to take them running if you're a runner. If you're a rock climber, you take them rock climbing. In my case, my kid took me. My husband takes my son hiking all the time and running. I have run races side by side with my kid in public. You want to teach your kids to knit. You want to teach your kids to spin. You want to teach them to weave, to dye, to do whatever you're doing, to crochet. And you start from, what do you want? My son once looked at me and said, make me a hat. I said, make it yourself. He didn't take up the challenge. I think there was a macho thing with his dad going on, but I know that time will come. You want to give your kids skills. You want to really fight back against the boredom yourself. 
We all laughed because Gwyneth Paltrow at the beginning of the quarantine said, oh, look, you could learn a new language. Well, I guess if it's you, Gwyneth, and you don't have to work for a living. But to be honest, a lot of people did try new skills. And I was disheartened because a lot of my colleagues published these rants about you don't have to learn a new skill. You're probably depressed with the quarantine. Just sit in your bed and be depressed. Baloney. Baloney. You shouldn't feel pressured. I agree that far. But the reality is, if you're fighting boredom, you learn a new skill. That's how humans do it. And it's a wonderful way to manage your mood. Honest to Pete, I've had both clinical depression and I've had clinical anxiety in the form of PTSD. And you know how I manage it? I was knitting lace tonight to manage it. Skills help us manage our mood. We shouldn't be talking about them as this kind of punishment inflicted because we have depression. They help us. We all know the story of some woman who lost her husband and couldn't stop knitting because that was helping her mood. Skills help humans. We're designed to use skills to improve our lives, to make things for ourselves and to manage our mood. So when you're getting anxious and you're chalking it up to the quarantine, I'm cool with that. We've all gone through that. And God knows all of us have lost sleep over the quarantine and that's a very normal thing right now. But I would challenge you are you bored? Do you need to pick up a new skill? Yes. In the last three months, puzzles, which I've never done in my life, and rock climbing. Come on, guys. I'm 61 years old. If I can do it, you can do it. Pick up a new skill. Take a master class. But remember, when you're feeling bad, it may simply be boredom. And we've all forgotten how to manage that because we've been using our screens when we also could use many, many more skills. Minerva gets the last word. I have a picture there of me knitting on the ribbing of my sweater. And there is Minerva. I'm sitting on my bed with my legs crossed. There is Minerva lying there with her paw over the edge, which is the Minerva symbol of I own this bed. Below her is Eleanor. She's lying with her butt towards Minerva, but she's lying close to the bed. That is her symbol of I own this human and I'm ignoring you cat. The curious thing is that picture made me think about how much they communicate with each other. Here's what's interesting. As humans, we are very hierarchical. And one of the terrible things we've done in certainly Western culture is we've extended that hierarchy into the animal world and the natural world. It's not enough for us to arrange ourselves in a hierarchy to say, for example, Joe Biden is the president of the United States, so he's above me in the political hierarchy. I'm just somebody at the bottom, a voter. Okay, fine, I can handle that. We're tribal. This is what humans do. It's cost us a lot of problems, of course, but I'm not going to go there. But it is curious that we extend it downward. So we put all animals beneath us, anybody who can't speak our native tongue, basically. So we put foreigners beneath us, if you're reading Heron Carvick's Miss Seaton books. And if you just look at all our history, we put animals beneath us. Not all humans do that. Native Americans certainly don't seem to, from what I've seen outside their culture, they seem to respect animals as beings with similar rights and privileges to their own, whom occasionally they must kill in the name of survival. And they apologize for the killing, but they do it, okay? So not every culture of humans is doing this, but I find it curious how Western culture does that, puts the animals below us. What's fascinating is dogs have a pack order. And yet the dog does not put the cat below her. She treats her like a sort of space alien. The cat, of course, is a tribal animal with a different tribal structure than humans or dogs. And the cat seems to treat the dog as a rather peculiar, large companion. So they do talk to each other. They do not try to speak each other's languages, as far as I can tell. Now, I will use Minerva's language. I can't lash my tail, but I can narrow my eyes to show affection at her. And she does react to it. And I will groom her with my chin and she will purr. She reacts to that. So there are moments I try to use Minerva's language to talk to her. Minerva does not really try to use the dog's language. Both Blankets and Eleanor will come up and do puppy gestures inviting her to play. And they're mystified that she doesn't seem to know what they want. She will stand very still and watch this with interest. If they get too close, she'll smack their noses. They're very careful not to get too close. They know about the knives that live inside Minerva's toes. But I do find it interesting that dogs and cats respect each other. They seem to see each other as sort of separate beings, but still equivalent beings. 
They do not try to speak each other's languages, as far as I can tell, as opposed to the culture I was raised in, which is so hierarchical that we treat them as lesser beings, which they don't seem to do with each other or with me. And we tend to not regard them as having rights because they are lesser. It's kind of weird when you look at that and watch that all in play and when you begin to imagine it otherwise. Okay, everybody, so it's been a really fun podcast. I still managed to get an hour and five minutes out of this or something like that. I'm sort of surprised. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. This is the part where I do all the COVID stuff. And I had an interesting thing. I had someone say to me yesterday in public, I mentioned something about COVID. I was talking to somebody in a restaurant and they, they grinned. This parent and child looked at each other and grinned. And I said, oh, okay. I said, oh, you're grinning. So I'm assuming you don't believe in COVID. Oh no, they said, we wear masks. But they said, we believe the vaccine is a hoax. And I looked at them and I thought, what is it? 60 million people now vaccinated, doing just fine. And that's not enough evidence for them. And I looked at them and for the first time I went, yeah, okay. Because I thought, I don't want you to die, but if you're going to die, die. Please stay away from small children. They're like, well, we're, we're taking precautions. We're wearing masks. And I'm thinking, if you can't understand the vaccine, can you understand the mask? Are you safe around small children? But from what they said, they're not around small children. I was deeply grateful. So I have to admit, I'm getting a little bit cold about this. Like, all right, you know, there's only so many times people can give you what is really obvious and clear evidence and you take your BA degree from the local community college and you pit that against these people who spend their lives doing research and you tell them they're wrong. As long as you're not spreading it to the vulnerable, which is my one big fear. And you live with your consequences. So, you know, for the rest of us, I'm going to say, please get your booster shots if you can. Get your vaccine if for some reason you haven't been able to. Please social distance, please wash your hands, please wear your mask, because now more than ever, we need to stay safe and take care of each other so I can talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.